Pork rice. passages we've looked at, aren't they? They are passages you've looked at. Yes. The, the important points, uh, which I think my Lord Lord Justice Singh picked up yesterday, uh, that there is what we would say the unlawful reason uh, separately itemised, I think it's a paragraph E and paragraph 599, that the guarantee issue, and there is paragraph 600, saying, I paraphrase, but saying in terms, all of these reasons are taken into account. When you go, uh, because we, we asked whether that was a complete record, if your Lordship should wonder, uh, Mr. Lowe's third witness statement, uh, Supplementary Bundle 3, Tab 67, 1298, Paragraph 3 and 4 will confirm for you that that is a full and complete record. So that we know 
that when the decision was taken, the guarantee reason was a reason which was taken into account as a distinct matter for the decision. Beyond that, we have the same day, uh, and I'll deal with the Article 9 issues separately, I know a little later on, the same day the Secretary of State going to Parliament and telling Parliament what it was that had influenced his decision in terms which, if, if I may respectfully borrow an expression, trumpeted the importance uh, that the guarantee issue had played in the decision because it was one of two matters that were highlighted. And your Lordship should note the language used on the 25th of October 2016, uh, and when you look at the transcript, please, will you just identify the word certainty in what was said, and then look back at the Secretary of State's uh, uh, speaking note uh, and uh, what he said uh, as the final matter I have also had no certainty uh, so 25th of October same day as the decision the Secretary of State highlights the importance of what we say is the unlawful reason it, it's right as uh, my Lord, uh, Lord Justice Haddon Cave said it was some months later uh, in fact over a year later the Secretary of State in February uh, appeared before uh, the House of Commons uh, Select Committee, the Transport Select Committee, uh, and had his appearance in which he said, again, in terms, that this was, and you have all the words that were used, fundamental, important, and the like. But important again, you were given two references. Uh, the, the, the first uh, we, we've um, referred to in the second referred to in our scheduled argument, but the second reference picks up again uh, the word certainty, the Secretary of State returning to it. Uh, it, it is, uh, of course, quite right to say that the Secretary of State was recalling uh, something which had happened over a year earlier, but it is striking, isn't it, that he should have recalled this matter, the guarantee issue, as being a significant issue. Of all the things that he should remember, this was one of the ones he remembered as being significant or important. And we can go beyond that, of course, because we know that about uh, well, just over two weeks <coughs> after that appearance, uh, on the 7th of February, uh, the Secretary of State wrote to the Select Committee Chairman and said, I have carefully reviewed, I paraphrase, I have carefully reviewed the transcript. I want you to have a clear and unambiguous record from me of what our position is. And thereafter, there is a detailed uh, letter with an annex running into some detail explaining all the things that the Secretary of State, if you'll forgive me for the use of euphemism, wish to clarify to the committee as his position. You will look in vain to see any desire on his part to clarify his position in relation to his reasons for rejecting the ENR. That, that letter is at uh, Supplementary, Supplementary Bundle 3, uh, tab 60, uh, and it's the first page that I've particularly referred to today for the reasons I've indicated. Your Lordship should look uh, at, um, uh, at, at the whole letter. Uh, and subsequently, subsequently, of course, I beg your pardon, the letter is not uh, tab 60, it's tab 50. Yeah. Uh, and it's in court, it's in supplementary bundle 2. What two. is in supplementary bundle 3 at tab 60 yeah. is the note of the meeting on the 5th of September uh, 2018. Uh, and that's the final piece of evidence which we invite you to consider. Uh, and this, as you know, is after the proceedings have started. I'm going to come to it in a little more detail later on. But even in that, after uh, the proceedings had started uh, review, the Secretary of State did not say this was not a reason at all for my decision. I gave it no weight. He referred to it in a variety of different ways. For the first time, the words having been used by one of his advisors, I think one of the lawyers at the meeting, the expression reinforcing reason appeared. But it was still a reason. So wherever one looks in that narrative, there is simply no support for the proposition 
that the Secretary of State treated the guarantee as being something which was irrelevant to his decision. At every stage, it was treated as relevant and something which was being given weight. A third uh, a matter, my learned friend submitted that the court was entitled to look at the substance of the decision. Uh, logically, it was said, the guarantee wasn't needed, and so the court should assume that the logic appealed to the decision-maker. With, with great respect, that's an invitation into forbidden territory. It's an invitation to retake the decision. An invitation, uh, impermissibly, to try and understand the reasoning of the decision-maker at the time. What, what we know beyond the peradventure is that prior to the 16th of August 2016, no one on behalf of the department suggested it was necessary or appropriate to seek a guarantee of Howe's willingness to implement the ENR scheme if it was chosen. We know that on the 17th of August, the Secretary of State, of his own volition, asked the question presented, as it was thereafter referred to, the challenge. We know that he thereafter pursued it. We know that he pursued it in the way I've just described through the narrative. There is no reason to assume that any stage that he let go of the matter, indeed the evidence all points in a different direction. The Secretary of State, uh, despite what Mr. Palmer says, was clearly not persuaded that the Air Force Commission's reasons were an adequate basis for him ignoring everything else, and in particular, ignoring what, uh, and I stress that opening a pejorative thing, was rather like his right idea. His idea for, let's sort this matter out. Uh, the, the fact is, the evidence shows, if he'd had the guarantee, he would have revisited the Air Force Commission's work with all the additional material uh, available to him in order to make the decision. That's what he said on the 5th of September uh, 2018. And uh, this time I'm afraid I would like you to take up the document. So this is <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Supplementary Bundle 3. Extent, note the word please, extent to which a HAL guarantee of assurance was a factor in the Secretary of State's decision to designate the ANPS either linked into the issue about safety or as a wider point. No, no one started this meeting and the Secretary of State did not say, Mr. Goodwin, forgive me, uh, this is not a question of the extent. I, I just didn't give it any consideration at all. It was irrelevant. I put it to one side. Uh, and my Lord bless you should think I'm being too particular about something that was um, uh, uh, really not not uh, not to be given that sort of weight. But please keep uh, a, a finger in tab 60. So this is the 5th of September 2018. It is. Yeah. This is after the proceedings have started when there was every incentive for the Secretary of State to, um, to ensure that he was accurate. And that lest your lordship should think that I'm being too particular about the wording in that relatively brief note, just t turn on, would you, in the bundle to uh, tab 66 and page 1285. And this is um, this second witness statement. Page 1285. 
should find a subheading, September 2018, with the Secretary of State issue of guarantee. The paragraph 129, she says, the meeting itself was intended to explore the extent to which written guarantee information was factored in the Secretary of State's decision. Again, uh, no one was starting with an additional whether, uh, whether it uh, was a factor. You should notice further through the paragraph. Instead, the meeting was held as a matter of good practice to confirm the Secretary of State's precise thinking before responding to HUB's application for judicial review to ensure that his views were accurately represented <coughs> for the benefit of the court and uh, HUB. She then quotes uh, from the meeting. And if you go to the top of the next page, you'll see uh, the, the continuation of a sentence that starts at the bottom of 12, 1285. My understanding was that he was seeking to summarise what the Secretary of State was telling us, so as to be absolutely sure we had a correct understanding of the Secretary of State's thought process, to be sure it was accurately reflected in our summary ground. And then 132, the totality of this conversation was captured in a, a note. So on. So uh, when I picked up the reference to extent, that's what the evidence showed. This was a meeting about not whether he took it into account, but the extent to which he took it into account. If you go back, please, to the meeting now, it, you can see, and um, um, my lords, you've been taken through this uh, before, uh, but you can see what the Secretary of State responded to Mr. Good looked at it the other way around, and so on. Uh, and at the end of that first statement of the Secretary of State, he says, the question was, was there anything new? Was there anything, anything to change that view? And then he refers to the guarantee, a big factor in preventing me moving away from the AC was view, was that even if the AC had got it wrong, there was no guarantee it would be built. Uh, so the main points were the AC points, Secretary of State, yes, nothing had changed. My Lord's again keeping, if you would, a finger in uh, uh, page 1079. You just turn to tab 62. Uh, and go to page uh, 1108. This is Ms. Lowe's first witness statement. You can see uh, that um, 547, she refers to criticisms which were made by the appellants, and that there was then a review of the Airports Commission's work. 551, you should note, please, in passing, from the outset, we recognise the different position of HUD. And then, please, to page 1111, <coughs> and paragraph 557, which is telling you that HUB submitted additional information after the Air Force Commission's work, critiquing what the Air Force Commission had done. In other words, requiring somebody to consider whether or not the Air Force Commission was indeed right and whether those conclusions of the Airport Commission could be relied on. All of that material has been referred to there. Part of the product of that, you can see at paragraph 558, where Ms. Lowe tells us that uh, 14th of December, following the meeting of the subcommittee, uh, all ministerial statement. And then you should see the fourth bullet point, they would undertake a package of further work on the whole series of matters that uh, uh, four of them referred to. Not deliverability, but air quality and so on. If you then uh, turn on, please, to page 1114, paragraph 5, 6, 7, if you will see... Paragraph 567, 
that in relation to an air quality concern that has been raised about HUD's proposals, it, it was concluded, and I quote, that the proposals <coughs> could address the concerns raised by the AC in regards to air quality. 568. We did not consider the other concerns raised by the AC in relation to the NR had been satisfactorily met. But the consequence of that is quite straightforward. Post the AC final report, and in the context of a review of it, the department had received a substantial amount of information uh, from the appellants uh, seeking to question what the Air Force Commission had done. At least in respect of one matter relating to an air quality concern, it, it's accepted that that met the Air Force Commission's concern about that aspect. Now go back, please, to uh, page 1079 and the meeting of the 5th of September. Uh, and the answer I referred to following Mr. Adult's question, Adult's question. So the main point for the AC points, yes, nothing has changed. But in that respect, it's not right. And the same point appears <laughs> excuse me, in the Divisional Court's judgment. Uh, uh, if you could keep open uh, page 1079, but just look at the Divisional Court's judgment at paragraph 138. statement of his thinking. In both statements, the Secretary of State was considering whether there existed an objective reason for departing from the recommendation for the AC that the ENR scheme was to be preferred. Such an objective reason might have been a change in the objective merits. Uh, the fact is that the AC's recommendation would not depart it from because there was no good reason to do so. As the Secretary of State pointed out after the event, though the operator of GAP had improved the merits, of its scheme and thus required further careful consideration, the merits of the ENR scheme had remained exactly the same. And that, that, that is not correct, uh, and it's not correct, as it appears in the note of the meeting of the 5th of September. But what you can see from the 5th of September meeting note is the guarantee issue playing its part. Because with the guarantee issue from the Secretary of State's point of view, not satisfied, not met. I have not had the assurance and the certainty. He, he, he came at his decision with a closed mind, we say, and this note evidences it. So, if, if you'll forgive me for the brief repetition, here is a meeting designed to explore precisely and accurately the extent to which the guarantee issue featured in the Secretary of State's thinking and it records precisely that he closed his mind to a reconsideration of the merits post the AC's final report because he had not had the guarantee. Now, one might characterize it as a reinforcing reason. And that expression, reinforcing reason, appears first in the mountain of paper we have in the penultimate um, uh, response on this uh, note from Mr. Abbott again. Uh, so it would be right to describe the guarantee as a reinforcing reason. So uh, at the first point, it's still a reason. It, it's not. And the Secretary of State's reply was not. No, it's not a reason at all. I had completely put it to one side. I gave it no weight at all. It had been jettisoned. His answer was yes. And at the end, it was the biggest reason for not overturning the conclusions of the AC. Not the evidence, not the submissions made by, by her. The biggest reason was I couldn't get the guarantee that I wanted. <coughs> so, 
So that when, when your Lordship see, uh, uh, said on, uh, on behalf uh, of the, uh, the Secretary of State, uh, tab 66 in the same volume, page 1275, second witness statement. In that context, the documents referred to indicate that ministers considered all relevant evidence with an open mind to reach an evidence-based decision. Such an approach is integral to good policy making and is, in fact, is routinely adopted by the government. It does not suggest the government was establishing a market and so on. The, um, the, the meeting note of the 5th of September 2018 the, the document which I don't think I know sure Mr. Palmer spent so much time on at all is in one respect the best evidence the, the appellants have that the guarantee had been and continued to be for the Secretary of State a reason for his decision which he was unwilling to let go of to the point where even if there was new evidence which might have called for a consideration of the Air Force Commission's findings, he, he was unwilling to consider it because of the existence uh, of that fact in relation to the guarantee. Um, the, the fourth matter that arises from my learned friend's submissions, um, uh, the reference yesterday to what the Secretary of State told Parliament, he, he misspoke. I've reminded you that the Secretary of State wrote, or someone wrote on his name, in fact it was he who signed the letter two weeks after his select committee appearance and said in terms how carefully he looked at the matter and reviewed the transcript. There is no question that what he said on the 7th of February he meant to say and was his considered view. Now I turn to legitimate expectation that the, uh, the Secretary of State's position the, the guarantee and an understanding of when an agreement with uh, Heathrow Airport might be expected and when it would be sought. The Secretary of State, uh, my learned friend relied on behalf of the Secretary of State on Ms. Lowe's second witness statement, and he took you <coughs> in volume three uh, of the supplementary bundle uh, to paragraph 121, that's page. 1281 in the bundle. 1281, paragraph 121, he took you this, <coughs> this lay saying in the second written statement, in the light of the above, I do not accept, and the records do not support the contention that we had agreed, far less recorded in the SOP that the time for engaging with how to obtain any assurances or guarantees would only be after the ENL scheme was preferred. And that was relied on in support of the view that there was here no basis for a legitimate expectation that that factor would not feature in the preference decision. The, the difficulty with reliance uh, on, on that matter is that, uh, and let's take perhaps the clearest reference from the High Court's judgment, first of all, paragraph 128. of our legitimate expectation. The last sentence of the same paragraph 
puts it rather more clearly in terms of the time scale. The stance taken by the Secretary of State in, it, in relation to this risk was discussed and after debate appears to have been settled well before then, by about September or October 2015. So I don't need to and I do not rely on the statement of principles uh, in order to found any legitimate expectation or the existence of it. And in order to make good that last sentence of the paragraph, paragraph 128 uh, of the court's judgment, I re remind you, if I may, of what they said of paragraph 38.
you will find Mr. Graham of the Secretariat of the Air Force Commission telling you about the deliverability of the ENR. 167, final report, made it clear all three schemes were deliverable by 2030. On balance, AT doesn't consider that delivery risks are substantially different. So the Secretary of State had nothing from the Air Force Commission to distinguish these schemes in terms of deliverability, so that in terms of his accepting, as it was said he had, the Air Force Commission's recommendations, there was nothing here, nothing in the AC's final report to allow him to distinguish them on deliverability. But it's the next paragraph that uh, gives the lie to any suggestion that the Air Force Commission was only dealing with objective factors, 168. However, that is not to say that throughout the assessment of the three shortlisted options, the AC was not always aware that the ENR was different in two ways. First, it was a novel layout with no direct global precedent. And secondly, it was not promoted by an existing airport operator. Okay, here is uh, the head of the Secretariat saying that throughout the AC's processes, this factor was something which featured in the Airport Commission's awareness. And if you go over the page, <coughs> paragraph 170, it, you will see that Mr. Graham identifies, by way of some amplification, of the extent of the awareness and the extent to which uh, the issue had been taken into account. The very document which you've now been provided with, November 2014, uh, assessment of deliverability, uh, with that paragraph 419 referred to by him. So, my lords, it simply is not possible to say that the Air Force Commission was not aware of and did not take into account throughout its processes that there was here a distinction between hub and others. It therefore, I respectfully submit, follows that what we submitted in opening to you, that is, that the Secretary of State had every opportunity through the Admiral <coughs> Commission processes to disabuse them of the irrelevance of this factor, to make uh, some requirement, some explicit requirement, if you're going to promote, if we're going to have any scheme at an airport which is not uh, owned or controlled by the promoter, then we, we must consider the, the mechanism, some form of assurance that it could have been nothing of the kind. To the extent, then, putting in context what the High Court said in paragraphs 38 and 128, that by as early in the review process of the Airports Commission's work, that is August, September of 2015, everyone had put the issue to bed, that is, the guarantee issue to bed, as being in irrelevance. My lords, that, that, that founds, and I submit, makes good uh, our legitimate expectation uh, here. Uh, we've provided you with other authorities. I'm very sorry that we should so tactfully have left out of the bundle the Dudley uh, Metropolitan Borough Council. Yeah. Dudley. It was Dudley, yeah. not Walsall. Close by, and the, very much the same black country accent would be spoken in both, but uh, it was Dudley and a uh, copy is available. We, we did get as far as providing, and uh, we commented on Luton, which my Lord re refers to in the Dudley decision, but uh, uh, it, it was the Dudley case, and I think the copies are available. Okay. Yes, if they are available, I, I, I'd certainly be grateful if, right. if I could see it. Copies of Dudley. Not because it, it, says, it doesn't say anything profound, but I just try to summarise sure. the earlier authorities. That's well, if I may say so, it was a lengthy and uh, now being too egregious, careful judgment. <laughs> uh, but uh, from our, our point of view, it wasn't necessary to add to uh, the, the model. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Right. So let, let me... Are you going to refer to this? No, no don't need right. to. Well, let's just uh, put, it, let's put it somewhere. I've provided a legitimate expectation now to review the authorities and rely on what we said in the note in our submissions yesterday. Yeah. Uh, we will provide a consolidated index of all the authorities yeah. with the other parties. It should be 68. 68. 
investigating. Thank you. Thank you. Put it in what was the slender. Thank you. Well done. Mm. What was slender? Well, we, yeah, no, no, no. no we, 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 don't engage with that. Uh, yeah. So, can I just, for the sake yeah. of completeness, mention that Mr. Banner handed to us United Brands. Oh, yes. Which is currently loose. It needs a oh. home. Sorry. Well, United 69. Brands, shall we call that 69? I, I, I believe, by the way, I, I call it 68, because you're probably just number it, not mine, and I may well have got my numbers. Oh, what was 68? What was 68? 68 are United Brands. Yes. Burning, burning from time. Yes, very well. Right. Let, let's not do it. You can have we, that. We you can have provide. that. You can have that. Uh, that time back, Mr. Yeah, Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, next to the issue for the rise of the United States Commission on the Health and Safety State, a repeated submission that the Secretary of State was accepting the Air Force Commission's findings. He wasn't. Uh, he, he did not accept their findings. So, uh, it, with regard to deliverability and what bore on deliverability, uh, I'm not going to ask you to turn it up, but please write the reference down. Supplementary bundle 1, tab 22, page 441, paragraphs 1151 to 1154. The Air Force Commission said in terms there is no difference between the Heathrow schemes in terms of their deliverability. They both got challenges, they are deliverable. There is no difference. And we know that that was informed by the assessment in the November 2014 paper, among other things, paragraph 419, the promoter, so called, by the Divisional Court, promoter specific risk. The Secretary of State did not accept that. He started off on the 17th of August 2016 on a furrow of his own, say, I'm, I'm not happy about it. And he did so against the background of um, the background of the uh, appellants having been told in March 2016 that the department did accept that the scheme was delivered. Uh, the reference to that is the AFN agreed factual narrative, paragraph 25.6, call bundle 4, tab 10, 1623. Next point, the Secretary of State has here to the advice in paragraph 99 of the Cabinet Paper of the 25th of October 2016. He did, is the response to that, compare his speaking note in paragraph 599 of this is his first witness statement <coughs> with what paragraph 99 says. Paragraph 99 says it's not a problem. The Secretary of State said it's a problem. And we took it into account. Mr. Doe said it was taken into account in the decision making. He did not adhere to the advice he'd been given. Parliamentary statements. The Article 9 issue. Article 9 exists to protect the privileges of Parliament. It does not exist to protect the executive from the review of its actions by the courts. Uh, for, for that proposition, I rely on the decision in Tucson. That's Authorities Bundle 4, Tab 53. Time will not permit an entertaining review of the paragraphs at 17, 23, and 29. Bear some reading. R Reliance is placed on OGC and Kamafi. Then Mr. Justice Stanley Burton and Mr. Justice Stewart, respectively. But it, it needs to be noted, paragraph 44 of OGC, paragraph 20 of Kamal, both approve what was said in Tucson. And what we seek is no more than what was sought in Tucson. And it might also concern that two sides of Privy Council decision. Well, there is a, a link which you'll easily discern between two sides, Preble, also Privy Council, and then Al Fayed, Hamilton and Al Fayed. And there is one distinguished legal person.
personality who appears in both Trouble and Hamilton and our fires. And you will not find uh, any disapproval of any of the principles in two summits emerging from our fires. And it's important, it, it, important in this context that the court should not proceed on the Article 9 issue in a way that allows <coughs> uh, any member of the executive to say, well, I know that that's uh, a statement I made in Parliament about why I did something outside Parliament. But um, because you've challenged the lawfulness uh, of the decision, actually, I don't agree with what you're saying about what I said in Parliament. So the get out, if you'll forgive me, uh, the phrase, the get out of jail free card uh, for any member of the executive with regard to a parliamentary statement, which is in any sense inconvenient, is I don't agree with your construction. That, that is to usurp the court's task. It is the court's task to determine objectively, as we said in Tucson, to determine objectively what <coughs> was the meaning of the words used. In this case, it is the court's task, I respectfully submit, to determine what the meaning was of the words used on the 25th of October 2016, the 7th of February 2018. And it would be, I respectfully submit, a misuse of Article 9. <coughs> but then to say that because the Minister has raised questions about the interpretation of the language. <coughs> Article 9 should operate so as to exclude any consideration by the court of the state. That, as I say, would operate to protect the executive from review. It would not operate to protect the privileges of Parliament. Uh, final point. Uh, legitimate expectation. Provided the note, provided the authorities which support the note. Um, may I just make, make clear the AC terms of reference? Uh, Mr. Palmer says, well, I don't find very much in here. But that's precisely our point. It's what's not in there that is important. There's no remit to only carefully consider non airport owners' needs here. And from that starting point, with those terms of reference provided, all the way through the four-year process, the Secretary of State did not change that position, though he knew, see Mr. Graham's written statement, paragraphs are not taking you to paragraphs 30 to 37, and following indeed where the appraisal process is addressed. The Secretary of State knew exactly what the Commission was doing. They <coughs> consulted. They consulted on it. So that expectation which the Divisional Court said had crystallised by September, I beg your pardon, by August, September 2015, that is that the guarantee issue or any form of guarantee issue would not be taken into account as a firm foundation in all that the Secretary of State did and did not do. And I remind you that the authorities support both action and, as it were, inaction in terms of a legitimate expectation for us. In that lengthy period, final point on legitimate expectation, here we are dealing with a very limited number, very limited class of persons, there were three people affected by the process that resulted in the final report. This is not a large group, not a large group contending for, as it were, a wide-ranging expectation related to any change of the government's position. It's a very narrowly contained <coughs> I mustn't trespass further on Mr. O'Donoghue's time because those are at least part of our submissions. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. O'Donoghue. <coughs> I start with uh, <coughs> a reply on our two grounds of appeal, yes. and then I will turn as quickly as I can to the three points raised by way of response. Yep. Uh, on our appeal, starting with ground one, uh, can I begin with the question of substantive <coughs> or lawfulness, and then address the point which has been raised by a number of your lordships and my own friends regarding the public law uh, dimension or consequences of that. Uh, my lords, can, I, can we first 
go back to the division court's judgment. Paragraph 198, please. recycling 
of the same bad point, which was rejected by the divisional court below. Now we see 197. Parliament says no abuse because the pal and the claimants are not competing in any economic market. In our view, that misunderstands the nature and purpose of Article 102. 102 is instead of protection of the process of competition, of the protection of competitors. Take a simple example, uh, they give a price discrimination example, last sentence. That is an abuse of the competition and an infringement of Article 102, even if neither customer is competing with the dominant undertaking. So to put this another way, how does a dominant undertaking has a special responsibility? As part of that special responsibility, it cannot be the beneficiary of the need to give a guarantee to a competing input scheme for the expansion of capacity uh, for airport services. And that is sufficient for my purposes. And again, I made this point yesterday, and nobody has sought to, to controvert it. The, the argument that there needs to be an ability or an actual effect was uh, emphasized in both the RTT case and in uh, Ambulance Glockner. And in both of those cases, the court rejected in very emphatic terms, and they confirmed that the mere possibility that the beneficiary of the conflict of interest uh, might be able to influence the condition of competition was sufficient. Now, can I just give the, give the court one, one reference? Uh, a lot of emphasis was placed on Ambulance Glockner. Uh, this is in Authorities 2, uh, the Advocate General's Opinion, and it's uh, tab 15A. Uh, we saw this yesterday, so I can take it very rapidly. It's uh, paragraph 1. It starts at 154. So this is the Advocate General's Opinion in Ambulance Glockner. Would see 154. So the heading is creation of conflict of interest. Uh, so that's clearly what was in mind. Then over the page of 157, uh, you see that the right to be consulted in the recommendation of the refusal following consultation. <coughs> then 116, 161, the Abbey General says, well, it's well, although they have an economic interest in refusing uh, to, 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 to give consent once consulted, it's only a right to be consulted final decision is taken by the public body. Which, which paragraph are you reading? Oh, forgive me, it's uh, 160, 161. Thank you. In the court of judgment. In the after general. In the after generals, yes. The opinion, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, so, 160, he says, well, it's, although they have an economic interest in refusing uh, the question on which they're consulted, uh, it's, it's just a right to be consulted, the final decision taken by the public body, uh, 161, no discretion, judicial review, and so on. Now, he concluded, of course, that the right of consultation uh, did not infringe 161, and the court in paragraph 43 expressly refers to the right of consultation and considers that there was an infringement of article 161. So it, it is not correct uh, to suggest that the right of consultation in this case was something incidental to the outcome of the case. It was the the, the one thing picked up by the Advocate General as tending to suggest a non-infringement, and it is the one thing mentioned by the Court of Paragraph 43 as suggesting an infringement. <coughs> now, in terms of where this leads me in terms of the public law dimension, I, I repeat the point that if the market is defined by the Divisional Court is a market that includes the expansion of airport capacity, and as the Divisional Court found at 1982, uh, the Secretary of State's decision-making process was part and parcel of the expansion of the market. Then, in my submission, the, the question of a distortion of competition impacting on an economic market and an impact on the decision-making process are one and the same thing in this case. And that is why we make this submission. Uh, under Section 13.1 of the Planning Act, and more generally, that if a substantive legal error in connection with that decision-making process has been committed, uh, that is something which sounds in a public law violation and a remedy. The second point we made, it was, it was uh, asked rhetorically by Mr. Palmer, well, what, what else could the Secretary of State have done? Well, the answer is very simple. In fact, he was obliged to do once he had created a conflict of interest that risked distorting competition, that should immediately have been withdrawn 
by a further public measure, making crystal clear that that factor would form no part of the decision-making process whatsoever. Now, that wasn't done. The, the question of the guarantee, at the very least, was a continuing and enduring one. We say it is uh, unambiguously clear that the lack of a guarantee continued up until the 5th of September 2018 to be uh, considered the biggest reason. But it can certainly fairly be said that at no stage did the, did the Secretary of State withdraw a measure that had created the potential for distorting competition. And again, in the language of Section 31 of the Planning Act, uh, HUB is perfectly entitled to rely on that omission right up to and including the designation in the AMPS as sounding in a public law violation and remedy. And finally, as, as your lordships will see from, our, from the section of our note on materiality dealing with relief, uh, there is, of course, the question of exceptional public interest as a matter of relief in any event, uh, which shouldn't be forgotten. And Mr. Farmer, of course, uh, mentioned in passing the principle of effectiveness. And in my submission, when one, when one is concerned with the directly affected treaty right, it has been infringed context of the largest privately financed infrastructure project in the world, it would be a significant breach of effectiveness if the illegality was not fully expunged and reflected in the public law relief and remedy. So that's all I want to say in ground one. On ground two, I can, I can take this in 10 seconds. My primary submission, as I said yesterday, is that if I'm correct that a distortion of competition crystallized at the point the guarantee was requested, it is utterly immaterial whether or not there is a distortion of competition or other competition at a subsequent DCO stage. If I'm right on that, that, that is the end of the two. There is a subsidiary point, which, which is unnecessary for my purposes, that uh, even if Aurora gets a slice or a significant slice of the action in relation to HAL scheme, or even if HAL, for some reason, ends up not implementing the lion's share of its scheme. That is irrelevant. The, the distortion of competition I care about is the distortion of the choice between the competing inputs by virtue of the guarantee. These were competing schemes. The fact that in relation to one of the schemes, there might be more or less competition is not irrelevant. Uh, turning now to the respondent's notice point, starting with dominance. Uh, two points. If I can first of all ask your lordships to turn to our second skeleton, which is in core. Uh, well, I think your lordships have it separately. Uh, for everybody else, it's in core four, we have 11, page 1870. So in, in simple terms, the CA has primarily 
not exclusively rely on competition or market definition for dominant considerations in reaching its conclusion, and that is why it was perfectly proper for the Division Court to rely on those conclusions, and it did. Uh, last point on dominance, if, if, if the Court can go back to um, paragraph 172 of, of the Division Court's judgment. between the house dominant in the market, division of airport services at Heathrow. However, a necessary part of that conclusion was that Heathrow Airport itself was the dominant provider of airport services in the southeast of England. If hypothetically speaking, there were another airport in the state of Heathrow in the southeast of England, then this might constitute a substitute service capable of competing with Heathrow, and so reduce the possibility of dominance of Heathrow. And then, my lords, uh, if I can just give you two further references. Uh, you will then see 175. Uh, the, the, this is, so this is a reference to the CA as market power determination. And the first quotation on the 175, so they, they, they talk about the, the, the differentiation between Heathrow and Gatwick, and the Heathrow is preferred to Gatwick. And then at 436, uh, bottom page, it says, Demand side analysis showed that the service that had offered at Heathrow was highly differentiated from the other services available at the other London airport, which suggests a market that is limited to Heathrow. Now, the, re the reason I bring your Lordship's attention to this is, uh, in my submission, the submission made by Mr. Pachena actually is, is a mischaracterization of the court's findings. Because what the court is saying in 172 is that in reaching a determination uh, of the market defined as Heathrow, the CAA necessarily took into account the extent of competition from Gatwick. And we see that very explicitly in the quotations of 175. Now, if that is right, and that isn't contested, uh, this amounts to a purely semantic point. Because what, if that is correct, one, one can say uh, either there is a market for uh, the southeast of England, in which Heathrow is not sufficiently constrained by Gatwick and other airports, or one can look at the other end of the telescope and say, well, in fact, Heathrow was so lacking in constraints from other airports that there is a market for Heathrow. But it amounts to the same thing. And the insight captured by the Court of 172 is that whichever end of the telescope you look at, the answer is the same. And we make the point in our skeleton, and I repeat it, uh, this is one of the most arid submissions I've ever encountered, because there hasn't been a single piece of submission or evidence put forward to suggest why the CAA is wrong in finding dominance. And there hasn't been any positive case advanced as to who exactly uh, how is competing with and how it is that it can charge the highest airport charges in the world, pay a dividend of a billion pounds a year, despite facing effective competition. And we've had no answer to either of these questions. Uh, it, it is a, a destructive and hollow submission with no basis in reality. So that is dominance. Uh, two final points, privileging and objective justification. On, on, on privileging, can we start, if I may, with, with a definitional issue? <coughs> yeah. I can quickly give you Lordship a few references. Can we start with authorities to tab 15? This is the MOTOE case. <coughs> Than its competitors. 
And if we can then quickly go to uh, FIFA, which you will take you very briefly, same volume, next tab. Seven, seven. So there, there, there are these three possibilities. Uh, monopoly, secondary situation where they can prevent the entry of competitors to the market sphere of the rights holder on grounds related to potential adverse effects on the operation of profitability of the rights holder activities. And third, where the rights holder is entitled under, to influence the terms under which the activity in question may be pursued by his competitors according to his interests or according to the consequences of their activity on that market. So we do say as a definitional matter that the definition of politics of, of privilege undertaking is much broader than contended for by the Secretary of State and comprises, uh, in particular, the last two examples I have given. Now, just to apply those definitions to, to, to this case, well, the, the first point uh, we wish to make, I can ask you to turn up the first supplemental bond. Money up from our scheme, 
the rab would move less. So we, we have a perverse situation where uh, somebody investing in a project wishes to expend more capital because more of that ca capital can be recovered through the rab. And one of, one of the many reasons we say that Hal is privileged, uh, and this, this, this is not a, not a Christian point, but the system of RAB regulation chosen by the CAA, which applies uniquely to HAL, gives rise, as we saw in the CAA's own report, to a type of treatment and privileging that is not available under competitive conditions in the market. In the market, if you or I invest capital, we may or may not recover our investment. Under this RAB, which is a discretionary decision by the CAA, HAL has the unique privilege of being guaranteed a return on its capital investments. So that is one of the important points of privileging. Um, two final points on privileging. Uh, you were taken at some pace to in some of the cases uh, where there is a reference to the fact of being a former public undertaking uh, being relevant in terms of assessment of, of a competition advantage. If I can quickly give you a couple more references. We start with Connect Austria, authorities two, tab two. Bundles of authorities do not have the index. Tab 70. Yes. situation which would lead it inter alia to offer reduced rates in particular to potential subscribers to the DCS safety hundred system, carry an intensive publicity campaign <coughs> with which Connect Austria would find difficult to compete. So there we see a reference to a former uh, statement of the uh, public ownership status but having, having an injury quality. Public ownership status I can understand, but the entity we're concerned with was never a monopoly, was it? Well, well the, 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 the critical point is that I mean, what, what the reference in 86 is to the client base. So it, it, it is the assets that go uh, hand in glove with, with the business and, and of course, to, to the networks. Um, so the, the, the critical point is that in terms of uh, enduring economic privilege, it is access to uh, essentially a captive customer base. And uh, in particular, as we'll see in the next authority, uh, public funding for the construction of the critical assets in question. Uh, the next authority, Slovak Telecom, tab 25. Citation about a third of the way into 166 to 
which they're not, follows that where the existence of domination has its origins in formal legal monopoly, that has to be taken into account in the situation of the advocate. I think I must have the. Uh, uh, I'm not reading. Is it, is it the advocate general's opinion? I'm looking at? Well, well, this is a general court general. Sorry. In which page is it at the top? I was it's uh, 28 of 18. Yeah, I was looking at page 19. Thank you. <coughs> Do you want us just to read the paragraph for that well, yes, some well, time? Well, we'll read the paragraph. by state resources, that, that is the critical insight uh, that I rely on. Right. Um, I'm going to have to read Well, we'll do that for you. Yes. Now, the, the point made again to this, well, these, these are Article 102 cases, but of course, in this case, we're concerned with the application of Article 161 in conjunction with Article 162. So, the analogy is a bit more good one. Um, final legal point before I turn to objective justification. Yes. We can quickly go back to the judgment. Mission is that the, the, the state measure in question it can equally amount to a basis for privilege. And it's, it's the first two sentences of 66. So, which page? Well, in it's internal page 4128. Next tab, MOTOE. Oh, just the just allow us to read 66. Oh. Yes, and the next paragraph. Oh, the next tab, oh, next, MOTOE. Next tab, MOTOE. Uh, tab of the General's Opinion. Tab 17? The no. Tab. So the previous tab. The previous tab. Oh, sorry, 19. Nineteen. Yeah. Right. MOTOE. Oh, yes. That's the Greek motorcycling yes. case. Oh, yes. And seventy-eight. She says the characteristic feature of such special suits of rights is the rise of special relation with the state and the authority of question that they can undertake and afford more favourable treatment to the undertaking than the creditors. And this, of course, is a case on point. The state measure gave a right uh, to help to 
give its consent. Uh, so the, the giving of consent uh, can itself uh, be, 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 be a question of privilege. Well, to conclude on privacy, uh, we, we say there are a series of complex interlocking findings in the judgment. And in addition, for the reasons I have given, one looks at these in a composite fashion. The case for privilege in this case is aptly made out. And indeed, when one thinks about this, I mean, the, the, the underlying purpose of Article 161 is to apply to public undertakings and former public undertakings. And the Paradigm case would be a, a former public undertaking where the assets in question have been transferred to the private sector, but the valuable assets in question have an enduring economic advantage or privilege in the market, uh, as we see in this case. So that is our essential submission on the privilege. And then to conclude on objective justification, I can just show you one, one authority, which is, which is Hilti, the authority is one. <coughs> the submission first would help, and then the authority to make it good. Oh, two submissions. Uh, first of all, in a conflict of interest situation, uh, it is simply not open to the government firm to advance um, objective justification based on, on allegedly legitimate. And second, to the, to the extent that the court of judicial considerations are put forward, if they are properly within the sphere of the relevant public safety authorities, uh, it, it is not within the mouth of the dominant firm to second guess or bring to bear those considerations. I'm sorry, you'll have to say we, this we, again. We just can't write that down that fast. <laughs> take, take your time. Just, just take that at, uh, at dictation speed, if you would, because it's a, it's a somewhat complex submission. Oh, yes. Or at least it sounds as if it is. Uh, it wasn't intended to be. No, well, well, if you spell it out, uh, well, well, we'll, 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 is we'll write it. Where there are competent public regulators, such as safety authorities, uh, it is not the role of the dominant firm to second guess matters more important than their And the, the authority for that is Hilti, which is in volume one of the authorities tab uh, nine, please. Thank you. Sorry, which body? <coughs> volume one. Thank you. Hilti. Hilti. So Hilti was a manufacturer of nail guns and nails, and it, it objected to the competitors using <coughs> their nails and Hilti's nail guns. Yes. And one of, one of the justifications of the two for its objections to its competitors was objective justification based on uh, safety. And you see in 102, there was a, a Hilti report by the professor, and then in 103 on the page, uh, a reference to a whole series of other studies, and then 104 statements from staff uh, attesting to, to, to alleged defects, uh, and so on. And reports uh, in short shrift to these arguments. Uh, 104. Page 1486. 1484. 1488. 1488. Eight. The, the numbers are cut off on those. Oh, you, well, the, the paragraph is 118, which on my. Give us the page number. It's 1489. Yeah. Oh, it's actually. Claims, characterization of the following. They're 
also authority vested with the powers to enforce those laws. In those circumstances, the Australian not the task of an undertaking opposition. It accepts its, its own initiative within the province, which, rightly or wrongly, regards as dangerous or at least inferior quality to its own products. So that the simple point is where you have competent public regulators. Uh, that is their job, and it is not for the dominant firm to second guess uh, matters falling within the agreement. And if one thinks about this in the context of this case, uh, we had an enormously complicated process involving the AC, the Civil Aviation Authority, the Department of Transport, the Secretary of State. Uh, huge influence. And to get to the end of that process and for how to say, well, we, we are unhappy about uh, aspects to do with safety, uh, it effectively amounts to a sort of proxy judicial review of, of the decision making of the competent bodies. We say, as a dominant firm, it is not open to have, at that stage, uh, to bring to bear considerations such as that. And the essential point we make on objective justification in any event is that given that the measure had, in an open ended and unrestricted way, uh, talked of the giving of a guarantee, it was impossible in that context to disentangle good, bad, or indifferent reasons. And I gave your Lordship yesterday a handful of references to passages in the judgment where the court accepted that HAL may well have had reasons of commercial self interest being advanced side by side by supposedly objective considerations. And we say that the, the, the vice in this case is the mixing and matching of those two things and the failure of the Secretary of State to guarantee that the process was not infected by the this inequality of opportunity. Those are the first my submissions. Uh, by the uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Donahue. Well, be, before I sit down, I've got um, extraneous um, happy Task, which is, well, um, before before you come to your tinge with sadness task, um, <laughs> I think we've exhausted the program. Um, nobody claims a right of reply on the respondent's notice. I discern that from the um, agreed timetable. no dissent. Uh, still before you come to your task, Mr. Donoghue, I apprehend I know what your task might be. Um, we have finished the business of the hearing. There remain Exchanges of written representations. Um, uh, if that's the point that we talked about this morning, model, I've taken instructions. No, 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 it's not. It's the WWF. Uh, model, yes, there is that. Model, 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 point this morning, model, by way of intervention, uh, forgive me. Um, that timetable is set by orders it, of this court. Uh, I simply announce that in open court. Um, that program runs out at the moment to, from memory, the 6th of November. Correct, yeah. Is that correct? Yes, my lord. We're on the 1st and then the 6th for the replies That's right. from uh, the other parties. Then you, Mr. Marici, wanted to come to the matter that was raised right at the beginning this morning. Yes, well, just to say that having taken instructions, we're content not to put anything further in. Right. You've got the essential points. Right, well, then let me ask a question generally. Have I omitted to remember any part of proceedings before us that ought to be mentioned at this stage. I don't believe I have. I think I've remembered everything I should. Is there anything else? Um, your task, Mr. Donnie. Sure. Uh, you have, well, there's no, there's no timetable set for this part of the proceedings. <laughs> Some of your orchards may be aware a number of members of the uh, bar. This is uh, certainly Mr. Nicholson's last appearance in this court. And some of the two room agrees on these proceedings in Parliament Square. It may well be his last appearance in uh, any tribunal. And I simply wish to wish him well. Um, so I do miss him. And I'm not sure if he has any interest. 
well, the last part is perhaps uh, an injunction that he may wish to consider. <laughs> uh, in fact, as I think uh, everybody will be aware, um, Mr. Kingston's clerk had kindly alerted my clerk to the fact that uh, this is his last case. Um, May the court associate itself, Mr. Donoghue, with your remarks and good wishes uh, and wish Mr. Kingston uh, well in his retirement. Uh, we uh, join, in, join in that. I'm sure the court generally joins in that. Um, thank you very much for saying what you have, Mr. Donoghue. We've wholeheartedly uh, supported um, we're not going to part from this hearing without uh, expressing our gratitude to all advocates, and I emphasise all advocates, um, those still present in court this afternoon, those who have been here at an earlier stage of the hearing and are not here this afternoon. We thank them, we thank all legal representatives, the teams large and small who have worked so hard on the case, uh, all the good work that's been done in assembling documents, putting the, um, together the agreed materials for the court, supplementing those with helpful notes as appropriate. Thank you all very much. Uh, it has made our task a good deal easier than it would have been otherwise. Uh, I thank everybody, including the wider audience, uh, remotely from the courtroom for paying uh, attention so patiently and with such evident interest to the proceedings before us. Thank you all very much. Yes, uh, it need hardly be said uh, that we will take time to consider uh, our decision. Uh, judgment, will, judgment or judgments, more likely the latter, I think, judgments, plural will be circulated and draft in due course for uh, minor factual and typographical corrections only in the normal way. Uh, judgment will be handed down in due course uh, in the normal procedure. Uh, that is to say that all matters ought to be discussed and agreed by way of the court's order in advance of the hand down. Uh, so that there will be no need for attendance by counsel or other advocates at that point. I think that is all. Except that we have to say that we're extremely grateful for your patient uh, uh, consideration of many sometimes rather longer than they might have been perhaps sufficient. And for uh, it might not be a willingness to shoulder the burden, but at least uh, appearing to be reasonably cheerful about shouldering the burden uh, of uh, so substantial a case and uh, to Glenick that the bank so respectfully say so good humour throughout. Thank you. On behalf of us all. That is very kind, Mr Kingston. Thank you very much. There is one final thing I can <laughs> say, <laughs> which is uh, it would be quite remiss of me not to say this. We tend to forget sometimes the role of the court staff. Um, they make these hearings possible. Um, they make sitting late on a Friday afternoon possible. Um, we are extremely grateful to them um, for the work they do beyond the call of duty. Thank you very much. Thank you.